So um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. There's going to be a lot of questions. Um, I, I particularly don't have anything formally planned, but I'm really excited to answer all of your questions. And in response to something that was just said, I do want to say that the reason we have nutrition and health headlines almost every single day is because it rates. Not because of studies that are being published, it's because the consumers and viewers and readers are hungry for it. We're at a really cool time. People care about their health, they want to feel better, they want to live longer, um, they want to look more glamorous. So they're listening to our message. Um, I feel really excited to be here with you all. I'm honored and so appreciative to be able to communicate your brilliant studies. So thank you. I read the embargoed list every single day. And I can assure you that if your studies have not been reported on by me, I have pitched them. But we'll get into why some things resonate and why other, other things don't resonate and maybe what we could do a little bit differently. But um, now I'm with my friends up here who are true rock stars in the um, reporting world, in the dietetics world, and they're going to come up and they're going to each going to do a little bit something for you. I can't read their bios because I forgot my glasses. <laughs> so I'm going to have you all do that, and Toby's going to go first. Hi. So I'm going to be discussing the problem. I'm a registered dietitian uh, with a master's in clinical nutrition and dietetics, so I have worked in the clinical world as well. And as a side note, I did go to school with my mother, and we graduated together, so we're both registered dietitians. Um, and so um, I also write for five national publications at this time. Um, and they're very diverse, and I purposely do that because I want to reach all kinds of audiences. Um, but in terms of what's going on with the science and how it translates into the media, that's really where I wanted to go. And I just have a few slides. It'll get your mind kind of thinking, and then we can lead with a discussion with it after everybody kind of goes. So this is from Food Network's Healthy Eats, with Eats which I've been from the get-go about, I think, eight or nine years ago. I think one, one of my posts were the first one to go up. Um, and of course, sugar. We've mentioned it, so I wanted to reiterate it here. Is it toxic? Made headlines. Everybody was talking about it. So of course, you know, the headlines needs to be clickable. And I wrote about what is how much sugar for a man, how much sugar for a woman, differentiating. I mean, that's my role, differentiating, just defining for the general public in a way they understand. I then gave a talk in my son's middle school. I have a 13-year-old son, so um, I gave a talk about how to feed adolescents health, more healthfully. And the gentleman, and I live in an uh, area um, with a pretty, uh, we're upper middle class, if you will. He turns to me and he says, so explain to me, what is the difference between sugar in a donut to sugar in a fruit? That's to me, a very, if, if he didn't know that he's an educated person, that was a problem for me. Um, and then you have on the right hand side over here, uh, fruit snacks, are they healthy? You have people, and this is something I've heard time and time again or read on comments. Yeah, I put a fruit snack, that counts as a fruit. So you have other people saying that. Um, again, a huge problem. So are they healthy? Of course I explain everything, and the bottom line is, they're not fresh fruit, they're not fruit. You can't count it. Um, and then, about a year ago, I also write for US News um, and World Report Eat and Run, um, I was dating a very nice looking gentleman. <laughs> he had lost over 300 pounds, he should be in one year. Oh my, do I fit close? Yeah, yeah. yeah, totally should. Uh. Um, and we were talking about, you know, what people eat and what, and he just turned to me and he said to me, I don't eat fruit, it will make me fat. Obviously we didn't date very long after that. <laughs> and um, it actually, I started talking around and that's kind of what people were thinking, I was poking around the internet. And as such, I wrote this article and it did pretty well on the internet as well, it got syndicated. So that's with the sugar. I'm now moving to you know, some of the topics that everybody we've been talking about. Um, bacon. So I, I did a piece, this one went viral. 12 foods nutritionists say they won't ever eat. These pieces do very well. 
the negative do very well. Um, and so, you know, we had some fun with it. Ellie, I think you contributed one of them as well. Um, this one was by Bonnie Taub Dix. She said bacon. She said bacon because of the saturated fat content. That was her reasoning why. And this was for her. She was not making any recommendations to anyone else. And these are some of the comments uh, that, and she got personal emails too to this. Okay, so this is how it was translated to the public. There were over 350 comments. First comment, wow, how uneducated to, to, say, to say stay away from bacon. Saturated fat is not bad for us. Low carbs, moderate protein, and high good fats is the only way to live. Get rid of diabetes and high cholesterol. I eat uncured bacon, lots of bacon every week. The low fat diet doesn't work. We don't need whole grains or sugar or carbs or very little carbs. People quit listening to these so-called nutritionists. I thought that was kind of interesting. Second one, this morning on Yahoo, there was an article that said bacon, eggs, and grass-fed butter will help you lose weight. So right there, just exactly what we were talking about yesterday. Third one, I don't listen to anyone that doesn't like bacon. I don't need that kind of negativity in my life. Which just brings me to a point if you start pulling a lot of foods out that people either through their heritage or through their cultural are used to eating on a regular basis and you're gonna pull it from under them, they're not gonna listen to you. And so that's something that I'm trying to overcome. And the fourth one, it sucks that everything that tastes so good seems to be bad for you to eat. So again, this is just from, and remember, she wasn't making a recommendation, she was just saying for herself as an individual. Um, so one of the other ones that got a lot of attention, and I don't mean to open a can of worms here, pun intended by the way, um, crickets. So Frances Largeman Roth decided her answer, and I accepted it because I said, you know, this will be really fun to see what's going to happen with it. She said crickets, which we have never addressed in this conference, and she got so much negative comments on the cricket aspect because it has high protein and by the way this is another hot trending topic so just for fun kind of I wanted to show you some stuff that's going on out there um, and so I mean the bottom line here is and I think we were doing this flow a little bit before the science is up here the information and the flow and there has to be communication between each of these levels to the writers the editors the media and notice I put a double flow between the public to the writers and the editors because they have to listen to what the public wants. And one thing to me that I think that was a little bit, um, I, I would have been interested to hear at this conference, maybe some statistical analysis from the public of what they are looking for um, to get to that third level a little bit. And so we do need to, um, I know we're talking about the problems, there are some issues in the communication between these three levels. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Hi, I'm Janet Helm. I'm also a registered dietitian and I am a blogger. Nutrition Unplugged is my blog and I spend a lot of time trying to translate science, trying to translate probably even more so the headlines about science. So a recent example, you know, with Mark Bittman, butter is back. I said, really? Here's what maybe Mark Bittman should have said. So trying to translate that. I also um, created what's called the Nutrition Blog Network, which is an aggregator of blogs written by registered dietitians. Because I do believe that the blogosphere, which I guess I'm here on the panel representing, it can be part of the solution. I agree that they're also part of the problem right now, but trying to gain uh, the digital raise the digital presence of, of qualified nutrition experts communicating um, on, online. So we're here talking about the problem. This is what our panel is. The next panel, we're talking about the solution. So I wanted to talk about four reasons why I think that we're in the current situation that we are, the challenges of communicating common ground in the media. Uh, first is, we've kind of addressed this, that nutrition today is clickbait. Absolutely. Those headlines, and sometimes the headlines are, are the worst thing of all. The body of the content might not be so bad, might be more balanced, but it's the headline. But sometimes consumer never gets beyond that headline. And there, there are studies that show that the net more negative the headline, 
the more engagement or the more click-throughs that article will get. So there's a reason why there, there's those negative headlines. This study by Outbrain, which syndicates stories online, showed that negative headlines, those that have never or worst, are, got, gets 69% more click-throughs, someone clicking on that, reading the article, than they would if it was uh, talking about always or best, those more positive counterpart to that. So, you know, nutrition is, is a hot topic in the media. And, and I wrote about this. I happen to not like those negative headlines. I also write for US News. And, and I, they, these articles do really good. The worst foods you should never eat, or the sorry Toby, the foods dietitians should never eat. I don't like those stories. I mean, how are we helping the public if we're telling them what not to eat? And that's why I love the part of the consensus that talks about substitution and compared to what. So we have to go beyond the worst things, never eat, and, and talk about the positive. But right now, those kind of articles do well. I think that's part of our, our challenge in communicating because those articles, they, they sell magazine covers, you know, and, and they are, um, also have a lot of uh, click-throughs. Second reason is We've been telling stories for the beginning of mankind, and, and the key element of storytelling is conflict. And I think with, with storytelling, is, is all media is all about storytelling, and that's especially online. So we're, it's always the demonization, you know, we've got to find an enemy. So that is a big part of today's media, the storytelling, showing that conflict, looking at the conflict we, we've even had um, just now. Um, but conflict is what the media looks for, the demonization, that tension, points of tension. I mean, this was from 2002. It could easily be, um, be today, but it's that conflict, but that's what sells magazines with those, those types of covers. The third reason is the rise of citizen scientists. Now, we really haven't talked a lot about Food Babe um, during this, these two days, but we all know Food Babe, um, who I think does a lot of damage. And I think as, as she points to science not agreeing, People listen to her. There are people like that. They're filling the gap because seeing that there's not consensus. So she's got an amazing audience that she's built. And now there's the science babe. So it's the battle of the babes we have <laughs> right now. So, but th those people are gaining a lot of attention. But conflict right now is, is what they're really, th what's driving their, their audiences. And I think with that, the rise of citizen scientists, the, the rise of, of those without really any credentials, is the, the healthy eating guru. And what I call the eat like me, look like me trend. And so these are people that have no scientific credentials at all, but they have a huge following on Instagram, and they look good sipping their green smoothie in the morning and talking about what they eat. And it's this aspirational eating that drives so many followers. I mean, these people have more following than, than most daily newspapers. And so these are people that, you know, I, I think can be quite dangerous. They can be inspirational, um, but some of their advice ha has proven to be dangerous. I mean, these are the people that, you know, you know, Australia has some of these healthy eating bloggers that have gotten in a lot of trouble lately. I mean, one was pr saying that she cured cancer by eating raw food. The other was, promoting a, a uh, make your own paleo um, infant formula made from bone broth. So I think there can be some real dangerous advice out there, but this is what our consumer is getting a lot of information right now. And I think it leads us to the last point, is that consumers today are seeking their own solutions. So they're not always driven by science. I mean, there's a real bias right now, what Toby, I think, said about, oh, I'm not going to pay attention to what the registered dietitians might say or what the dietary guidelines say because Americans are fatter than ever. So there is that noise out there that this is what you know, big data or you know, what, what the mainstream nutritionists say I offer an alternative. And how consumers are making decisions about what they eat, whatever food tribe that they want to identify with, 
uh, it's a sense of community they have and, and also you know a sense of identity is they're making decisions not based on science but about how it makes me feel and, and that I think if anything is, is what the challenge because they're gonna try something because they feel better or they get their advice from their their friends and family Hi, my name is Monica Eng. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I have one more thing. Oh, sure, sure. I have one more thing. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so D David was citing Gertrude Stein. I'm going to I'm going to quote who I'm getting a lot of inspiration from these days is Amy Poehler, <laughs> who wrote Yes, Please. Um, and she's, there's a lot of wisdom in, in her book and from Amy Poehler, but I, I want to thank Old Ways for really putting this together. And I love the 11 points uh, that uh, the consensus I, I think are brilliant. I, I particularly love food literacy because it really comes down to it. You know, people want to know what I can eat. I mean, that's why I think none of those magazines should fold. None of those uh, websites should fold because it comes down to people need food choices. They need to know, what do I feed my family? What do I eat to be healthy? So oh, I love the consensus. I love all this talking. But as Amy so wisely said, the talking about the thing isn't the thing. The doing of the thing is the thing. So that's what I'm looking forward to, to doing the thing with, with all of you. So sorry, I missed you. I love Amy Poehler, too. <laughs> uh, my name is Monica Eng. I, uh, I've been doing journalism for 30 years. Started when I was 15 at the Chicago Sun-Times. My mom was dating Roger Ebert, so I got the job. Um, but in that time, I've covered, um, I've done a lot of uh, covering ethnic culture in Chicago. And that moved into covering um, ethnic food in Chicago. So I think Old Ways is a, it's a great place for me to be talking about this. But then I moved into covering food and dining um, as a recreational thing. I, um, I ate a zillion dumplings with Bill Daly. I think we went and we tried hot stickers in 100 places and, and the best taco. And then we, in 2009, they were firing everybody at the paper. And I came in one day and they said, Monica, you're going to be leaving. And I'm like, oh, how are my kids going to eat? They said, you're going to our watchdog investigative team. So in 2009, they turned me into an investigative reporter. Suddenly, I was covering FDA, USDA, and it's been almost all food policy since. So I've, I've used studies mostly in the vein of looking at science through the prism of policies that may or may not be introduced. Um, so when I, I do do some sort of nutrition stories for the food section, when I was at the Tribune, I should say, I left the Tribune two years ago to go to Chicago Public Radio, and I also do stuff for National Public Radio. Um, I also have a podcast called Chewing the Fat with Louisa Chu, Monica Yang, Chewing the Fat. Um, anyway, so, um, so I look at food in, in, in a lot of different ways. I look um, at the ethics of meat a lot. I've tried to become a hunter. Uh, it's no offense to any hunters out there, but hunting is like the worst thing. You're, you freeze and freeze and freeze and freeze and wait for the animal, and then when you kill it, you want to cry. Um, it's the both, I think, ethical way to get meat, but uh, my, my journey has been like trying to find what's best for you, what's best for the earth, and um, what's most palatable. So I've always been looking for delicious, ethical, and good for you. And I think we all know in this room, but it is, for some reason the public doesn't know, that can all come together if you do it right. But I don't think we have been doing it right. So even though I'm never supposed to be an advocate, I like to look at policies that try to get the society to do the right thing. Um, I think, I don't want to repeat everything I said, but basically, yeah, we have to go to our editors. When we get a pitch, we've got to convince the editor, and then the editor has to convince the news meeting that this is going to go in. So whether any of us like it or not, sexy sells. Um, they forced me to come in when everybody had already done the story about the who meat stuff. Monica, come in and weigh in on the who meat stuff. And basically what you say is, this is not new evidence. They're aggregating old stuff. They're reanalyzing it. And this is what they come up with. And my editors always hate it when a scientist says, well, you know, this study may have had limitations. And we're going to just have to add it to the existing body of science. And you know, this is just one small part, and, we, and it'll lead us to investigate more. Because that, to them, sounds boring. But obviously, that's science. And we have to find a way to communicate that. So I'm going to sit down now. And what I welcome is hearing what you want to hear from us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you all. Joy, I don't think you introduced yourself, so the, the, audience, the audience needs to know that the moderator up there is Joy Bauer, who's the dietitian for the Today Show. So thank you all. I, I want to toss a, a provocation to you, Joy, and share it with the, the panelists. So, you know, we, we've got this issue of, well, you know, clickbait, and here's what sells, and here's what editors want, and here's what producers want. And, and I'm just going to establish an analogy. Uh, some years ago, I was invited to a, a meeting of senior executives of Kraft, and they had convened a number of nutrition scientists, and they wanted our expert insights about food trends the next five years. And we went around this very big table, and everybody said very nice things about Kraft, and they got to me, and I said, I think I'm on the wrong bus. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm doing here, but I, I'm going to tell you guys what I really think. But, but the relevant issue was this. They were looking for people in public health nutrition to tell them what to expect from the consumers so they could satisfy the demand, sell their product. And I said, there's a critical issue here that you're overlooking, and that is you play a role in propagating the prevailing palate, right? And if you sell people ever more sugar and salt and hyper-processed food, you make that the familiar, you make that normative, people get used to it, familiar drives taste preference, then they want it, then you make it a little sweeter and a little saltier and they like it even better. So you're, you're actually, you are cultivating a, a negative trend in public health nutrition. And, and the real question here is not just where's the public headed, but what can you do about it so that you can do well by doing good? Same issue queued up then for the media. We can't just keep being told that what sells is fluff about nutrition, so if you say something sensible, we can't do anything with it. How do we win back this process? How do we say, yeah, but it is, it, to, to give a little bit of credit to that very strange prior talk, um, you know, I mean, it is irresponsible, frankly. Right. When we all, everybody in the mm -hmm. chain knows that this is fluff, but the public will love it, so let's sell it to them as if it's newsworthy. How do we fix it? So it's a great point, um, and it's like the million dollar question, but what I will say in response is that I don't think any of the quackery is going to go away. I really don't. So then the conundrum is that we are competing with it. Mm -hmm. So like my thought process is to sort of push the envelope on the headliner best as I can to engage the producers and the editors so that then I could um, produce or present a real quality spot. So that, that's what I do. Like when I read your studies, I think to myself, okay, how can I now sort of massage this into something that is engaging and entertaining and exciting so that I'll get traction on the other side? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, the other thing I want to say is I love the sort of controversy and the bickering in here because I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all plan. And I think that as long as we're, um, very sort of digestible and methodical with how we deliver the information, I think there's options for people. And one of the best rated series that I ever did on the Today Show, and it was at the top of the 8 o'clock hour, it was a couple of months ago, and it was on diet trends. And each day I focused on a different trend. And I did the Mediterranean, and I did paleo, and I did calorie counting, and I did vegan. And I sort of packaged it in, you know, the benefits, the pros, and some of the obstacles with each. And you now, as the viewer, make the decision which one you think is right for you, sort of a thing. Um, but, but to your point, and I would love for you guys to weigh in, we have to compete. So I, that stuff is never going to, the noise is never going to go away. But I think that if we can get you know, bigger and more powerful and um, more productive with our takeaway, manageable, realistic, really delivering what people can use today, I think our voices will be heard. And there's, they, they are being heard, don't you think? Yeah, they are being heard. I, I think we are competing, but I think there are lessons l that we can learn from the other side of maybe how they are, their voices are, are loud. I mean, how can we be just as loud with a, with a sound message? Right. When the, when the butter is back came out, so just to let you guys know, the Today Show threw it to me at 11 o'clock the night before. So obviously I couldn't get a hold of anybody. And I did the absolute best I can. I was very, very, tried to be very, very careful with what I was reporting, because all I had was the article. And then I quickly pitched after that, butter is not back. And nobody took it. 
Yeah, so it's tricky. Okay, I'm, I'm Dave Templeton, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Um, I don't think we're doing it right in terms of science and health coverage uh, because I know what I, and, and I think I'm trying to do it right. It doesn't always happen because this is a very complicated topic to translate very complicated studies at times, some that, some that aren't as clear that the news, that the news release might state it to be. Um, I think what happens here is you get a news release, as, as you do, and, and you're under pressure to do a story on, you know, Butter's back. When you have to turn around and do a story on that, that's where the problem comes in. We get embargoed releases, and I always ask for the study. Oftentimes, and maybe I'm not right away with it, maybe it's, it's some hours, because we have a three day lead time. You know, I call them, oh, you want the study? Well, let me see if I can get it for you. They ought to have it immediately yeah. you know, and send it out. When you read the study versus what the news release is, they're often a lot different. And then what you need to do is talk to the scientist who did the study. Because you cannot translate, except for the conclusions and the, you know, the uh, discussions and the conclusions, even sometimes those aren't real clear in what is in all those graphs and charts. What, what you really have to do then is once you write it, I go back to the scientist and say, this is what I'm going to say about it. And I'll tell you why. You can say, you know, uh, butter causes this. Butter, you know, we think it causes that. There's, there's these little variations that make it from accurate to inaccurate. It may cause a high, it, it may, or it causes a higher risk. It doesn't cause it, it's a higher risk for that. So you get in all these variations. Now, what we ultimately try to do is an extensive study with scientific reaction. You have to go to PubMed and, and look up, is, has anyone else done studies on butter or you know, meat or dairy? And, and you look in PubMed, which is a study database led by NIH, and, and you see what they say other people are saying about that, you can see some consensus, you can see some variation. Then you get reaction to this from a noted scientist in that field. Now, let me scold the scientists. I call scientists or email them, oh, I'm in Europe, can this wait two weeks? No, you can't. <laughs> well, who can I talk to? We'll call this guy. Oh, you know, he's on sabbatical. And, and, and you know, they always put the news releases on right at the end of the school year. Oh, he's now traveling. <laughs> so this is not an easy process. And anyone who takes a quick headline and runs with it is in trouble. You're in trouble. And, and you might say, okay, sometimes we're not the first to publish. But I get a lot of reaction from people, and I'm not saying my stories are perfect either, because even when I work with scientists, they're oh, you failed to say this, or you know, we, we, you should have added this in later. You know, you get, you get this feedback. But, but what you ultimately get is thanks from, uh, from your, your readership, and, and we have a very, we're one of the top 10 online uh, sites, newspaper sites in the country. We get four million, uh, hits a, a week. Um, we get all over the world, you get people, thank you for explaining that. Thanks for providing the detail. Because not everyone just wants a quick headline. Um, so what I'm saying is we're not generally doing this right. To do it right takes a lot of time and effort and you sweat bullets. I, I think that there are Everybody comes from different backgrounds, radio, TV, um, long form journalism. And I've done, you know, 20,000 20, word stories, but I also have to do 45 second news spots, sometimes on a study. And I have to get both the scientist, a quote from the scientist, and a quote from, from someone who might be pushing back. And it doesn't, unfortunately, I don't love that, I, I hate that format, but it doesn't leave a lot of room for nuance, unfortunately. <laughs> But, you know, we would all love to have more time and more space, for sure. So sometimes the, let's see if you get it on, online first, because they will stay. I, I, I know that's what drives the media. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes we have to take a little more time to know what we're writing about. 
Yeah, and sometimes what happens is the wire service gets it out first, and then every newspaper prints that around the country, and, and that was kind of wrong because they wanted to get it out first, and then newspapers don't do their own story on it. They pick up, you know, the, the wire. Yeah. yeah. You would hope. Hands? Who's, who's got a mic? Walter? Okay, thanks. Um, first, I just wanted to say that uh, we have lots of problems, and it's good we're talking about it, but uh, I don't think the system is entirely broken. That I do interact with a lot of really good science writers, and yeah. I think it's gotten better over the last decade or two, so there, there is a lot of good information out there, and the public is somehow sorting through all of this mess that they see sometimes miraculously, because we did publish last week trends in diet quality in the United States, and on average they are going, quality is getting better. And uh, we know that translates directly to reduced mortality and, and morbidity. Uh, so uh, something is getting through now. Obviously we'd like to make it more efficient, more effective, and, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, it, and it does, one of the biggest challenges I think was just uh, described uh, by your experience with the butter is back, uh, which illustrates so many of the problems, that that was really a failure on the scientific side, that uh, the article itself was just layered with flaws and mistakes, uh, didn't address the substitution issue, and that's mm -hmm. I think why a number of us are particularly uh, concerned about that, that failure. Uh, and then, why did the journal publish it? It was, if they had sent it to somebody who really knew the field, it, it would have been rejected and, and fixed. So I, something went wrong there, it, uh, both in the authorship. And it does give me a general concern. We've seen quite a few failures of meta-analyses, which uh, are somewhat almost unavoidable because as literature gets big, you have to have some sort of systematic review. But oftentimes, these are done by people who don't know the topic. And don't know nutrition, it's complicated, and you can make bad mistakes. I can go into extreme examples of errors in that particular meta-analysis where they didn't know that EPA and DHA were fish, or, or, or omega-3 fatty acids, for example. Um, so it's layers and layers of problems. But the, the really big one, and I, it was, I think, pointed out by the, the failure of the media to, uh, oh, well, they took the, that the headline story butters back and not the counter got correction there, right. uh, which which is pretty deeply troublesome uh, because uh, that, that, that it left the public with the incorrect information. And yeah, how do we fix that? I'm not sure, but that's something we really have to work on. Well, here, here's, here's what I did, and I think like everybody from the reporting standpoint is pretty seasoned in the room. I worked it in in other ways. So we could be clever and strategic with, if they don't take it as a headliner for one pitch or one featured segment, we get it in. Okay, well that's really good. It takes, uh, uh, we appreciate that, those kinds of uh, efforts. Uh, I, I think one thing that was correctly said um, in the previous presentation was that it's true that we don't have a breakthrough finding every two weeks or maybe not every two months. Uh, so the issue is how to generate the story a day that, or mm -hmm. uh, five stories a week that readers want. And it's good that they want news about information about nutrition. So that, that is a way of uh, giving uh, visibility and credibility to the study. It's, in fact, that breakthrough finding is often the least reliable. It really is a confirmatory mm -hmm. finding, as he himself pointed out, is most reliable. Uh, not the breakthrough finding, which is often not going to be confirmed. So uh, how, to, how to get that most reliable information out there and, and make that news, uh, you know how, that better than, how to do that better than we do, but I, hopefully we're providing information here, or ideas here, uh, that link, uh, oh, this is really important, it's a, it's a confirmation of something that is not really, couldn't be uh, confident about, uh, and then link it with sort of the heritage part of it, the practice part of it. What does that mean for eating dinner? Uh, it, it 
it seems like in some ways nutrition is good because there's so many um, things to link it to in terms of food production, in terms of mm -hmm. uh, meal planning, in terms of other health effects. And, and again, putting everything uh, that might be published into looking at all the health effects, not just one outcome is, is one of the really important elements. So uh, anyway, thank you for- I, I just wanted to comment back at that. Um, in terms of headlines, I don't write about the headlines all the time, um, but what I do is people also want recipes. So to teach, remember we were talking yeah. about, they need things to do, I call them my Toby tips. And I, I do them very nice sound bites. So they know what to do, how to store the, the fruits and vegetables, how to store the herbs. Food safety, I'm a huge advocate. I, I write about it and all everywhere, wherever I can get it in. Um, and then in terms of scientific studies, when I write these, um, let's say for shape.com, I write immensefitness.com, I do a lot of slideshows with healthy recipes where I do promote uh, registered dietitians who create them. Um, and I insert some of these findings in the messages. Um, and I get to write like three or four lines with every recipe. So I'm able to, maybe it's not new and fresh, but it is relatable to what they're cooking and they can feel good about it based on this and then give them kind of a, a little tip of science in what, there too. What you guys don't realize is that for every study that you publish, you actually give us like a bazillion articles to write. Yeah. Mm. Because like Toby said, it's not about the headline. Like I am using that information to, to present simple swaps all over the place via social media, mm -hmm. whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, on the Today Show, other NBC affiliates. I have a column in Women's Day magazine. So you are everywhere. So again, like, thank yeah. you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we are only as good as your research. Because I think it gets down to what the consumer wants is, is as much of the how-to. I mean, I think your science is the why, so that might be a nugget of it, but the how-to is what we need to make bigger because that's the swaps, that's the easy recipes, the menu ideas, because that's what gets lost in translation. Yeah, we need more beans, we need more fruits and vegetables, but people don't know what to do with a, a whole eggplant. You know, So I think it's just those kind of how-tos is we have to not forget that that's an important part of it. Right. So we've got another right. question. You've had your hand. Oh. So um, I wanted to ask. It sounds like a lot of. It seems like the consensus that seems to be arrive, you know, arriving here is very much that actually the guidelines can be pretty simple: plant-based foods, not too much, whole foods, right? Um, and I wanted to actually bring up the point that, that John Bohannon made about how often does news actually come along, right? Is it every day? Is it every two weeks? Um, and I'm curious if even by generating excellent coverage, if by generating a lot of coverage, we end up obscuring this very simple point um, and how you all kind of deal with that tension. First of all, it comes along several times a day. Yeah. So it is like fast moving and as soon as you, you know, fulfill three things that came in one day, six more are there the next day. So it's everywhere 24 seven in terms of the requests and the asks. Um, so we're trying to deliver as much as we can and you know we pass on a lot of stuff as well um, I don't think that I mean to me obviously because it's what I do and I'm in the field and I love my job I don't feel like it's overkill because what we're all masters of is creating fresh you know new exciting manageable action steps so as long as we're not repeating the same old over and over and over again, and people find it interesting and engaging, I think, to me, the more the better. Did, would you agree? I, I agree, and we also, a big thing I address too is um, barriers to change and behavioral change. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a big thing out there, but you can't slam somebody or the, the audience to make them, you don't want to belittle them. So I have to do it in a nice, finesse way to make them feel good about themselves, give them multiple options. Maybe they don't like a certain food. Maybe they do want their, um, their rice and beans every day. Maybe they're from, I used to counsel as a clinical dietitian a Dominican population. I needed to know what they were eating. I learned Spanish in three months and I counseled in Spanish. But I got in there and I understood and I was able to adapt to them. And that's, I do that in my writing too. So I make sure they can, I connect with them in some sort of level. I, then, I wanted to um, ask the scientists here, if we can somehow reach, um, I'm a dietitian and I'm a nutrition writer, but I also respond to the media when there's a news story. And, um, and to reach the PR departments of the um, scientists, the universities that are, that are conducting these studies, 
I just want to give an example. One day I got a phone call from National News in Canada, and they wanted to know my comment on the fact that eating an egg was as bad as smoking. And I was, and I spoke to the reporter and I said, what are you talking about? Where did you get this? And so she forwarded me the um, PR release from the University of Western Ontario, and it got worldwide coverage because it said eating an egg is as bad as smoking. And so, and as a nutrition writer, and I'm sure as scientists you see this all the time, but somehow we need to reach the PR departments of the universities that are releasing these press releases because they're doing a lot of damage and somehow mm. even, I mean, maybe I should have brought this up before, but it, in the consensus it should have been that um, the scientists need to tell their PR departments they need to be responsible because they are adding to this mess. That would be a case of pushing the uh, envelope a little too far on the headline. <laughs> yeah, that. But as a scientist, as, as a lead scientist, are you reviewing the press release that the university press office does on your study? Is that, that's, yeah. We don't always have time. Yeah. Is that mic on? No, we don't always have time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, listen, I have to comment on this being on both sides of the fence. This is often true when an A plus in an A plus place, in an A plus academic institution, the press will either the scientists will write a press release because people can't really figure it out who work yeah. in the offices, or they, they will take their time to do it and make sure nothing goes out. In a lot of places, because the people in the PR office are, are also rated and they get their raises and promotions and everything yeah. else about how much media coverage they have. So a typical example, and one of my colleagues and friends who's the chairman of a plastic surgery department, had something really awful come out. This is, I mean, this is, this is like skin graphic. It's, it's a very serious topic. And what he got in the mail was, if I don't hear from you by the end of the day, I'll assume it's fine. And this is an old PR trick in these offices that have trickled down. So a really great investigator can be trapped if they're not checking their email. I mean, this guy was in surgery, so he didn't get back for a day oh, and a half. So these are the kinds of issues. These mm. are really good points. So scientists have to push back and demand to these offices, do not send this out, or I'm going to tell the dean. I mean, yeah. things can happen in academics, but people just figure, who's going to read it? And that's where many academic people have their head in the sand thinking, oh, who cares? There's all this stuff. It's in Self Magazine. Or what difference does it make? It does make a difference. And academic people think, this is important. And as a scientist, I'm telling my press office, you can't do this and don't send things out without it. That's a way to push back in a way that is effective. And you know, people do it at A-plus institutions because we're used to that. But I think that's a message that should be really part of this game. Scientists need to lead in. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So I got a couple comments. One is there can be nutrition news every day. If one is about Alzheimer's, one is about osteoporosis, one is about adolescence, one is about the elderly, mm. one is about the microbiome. Right? As long as it's in context, it's not the whole planet should eat this thing. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. They did a rat study. They did a kid study. They did an epidemiological study. So, and you guys can help us translate that. So here's the thing about working together. This would be fun. Whenever a reporter calls me, one of my first lines is, what's your background so I know how much I have to explain oh, about yes, science? Yes, yes. Good idea. But that's because they call me. So maybe part of this meeting is actually setting up a network of connectors. You have some highly published people in this group. I, I don't actually know who that world is in the media. And so now I'm learning about that. That could be really helpful. We would love that. Yeah. We also. You know, we're scientists, we don't know how to communicate. So you will be a sad case if you call me, because I'm just going to ramble on and on about how excited don't, I am. Don't, they don't do media training with you guys? They do, no, okay. so I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> but really, a lot of us could use a lot more of it. So say there's three points, and then you ask us something else, you say, no, no, let me stick with my three points. That's what my <laughs> communications <laughs> folks right. tell me. <laughs> don't go, be, so can't we say this about your study, and you want to say, oh, that's what you want to say. You know, at the end of the day, you're really only going to include a line or two from us. But the background's relevant, so we could use some training even from a network of you. So my communications folks train me, but I'm not talking to them on the phone. I'm talking to you. So it'd be really fun if this network of, of folks at Old Ways set up created some guidelines for us so that we can do this thing. Give your three points, 
elaborate a little, and at the end say, does that still support the three points you said in the beginning? Because we're only going to run one quote of those three things, and what's the take-home mm -hmm. message? So right. this would be really fun to set up that an exchange here. I'd take it one step further and get some a reader or some pool or someone who does who has um, uh, an in with the readership so they know if they would accept it at the end or would it be popular if this is something they want as well. I was thinking the same thing. If you guys would ever be interested, you could tell us about studies that you're designing or studies that you're currently conducting and we might have some insight as to additional things that you can add that would be very sort of sexy and appealing to the viewers or to the readers and it would be an easy thing to maybe just do as an addition. So technically, this panel, as Joyce said at the beginning, was really about discussing the challenges and the problems. And we really didn't need to fix anything because there's another panel after lunch that's going to address that. Although you, starting in that direction, I think, is a good thing. It, a, a few very interesting themes. You know, first, the, the, the provocation from the back of the room that maybe we don't need news about nutrition every day. You know, I, I can't help but think that in the world's blue zones, they don't turn it, tune into television to learn a new way to eat every day, right? They just eat the way their parents ate and their grandparents ate, and it isn't news every day. And then the question is, what would you all be talking about instead? Although I think Christopher's suggestion, if you know, for the foreseeable future it is going to be news, it can be, well, the fundamentals of healthy eating are what they are, and there are variations on the theme, but there are stories about this condition, that condition, there are mm -hmm. human interest stories, and you know, maybe, maybe we, we can do both. The other thing, I can't help but reflect on the popularity of the cooking channel and the food network. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, you know, back to Amy Poehler, you know, m maybe the basic concepts aren't the issue, but there's an awful lot to discuss. Here's how I do it, here's how it works for me, and there's shopping, and there's cooking, and there's food selection, and there's making kids happy, and family-friendly cooking, and, you know, there are all sorts of variations on, on that theme. And then finally, this issue of, of healthy interaction, and, and I think part of the intent here in bringing this all together in the same room was to create those linkages. And I think Old Ways has, has plans to help facilitate that in the aftermath of this meeting so it's easier for us to find one another and potentially help do a better job of conveying responsible information because we, we do share in that mission. And as tempting as it is to go with the hyperbolic headline, if, the, if at the end of the day we stand between the public and good, actionable intel, then we have met the enemy and it is us, right? We're part of the problem and, and none of us wants to be in that position. So again, some initial discussion of the solution, uh, I think an excellent overview of some of the challenges and a second panel after lunch to further address the solutions. Uh, but we now stand between you and lunch, so let's thank the panel and then go. Mm -hmm.